What makes a perfect home recording studio? What do you need? What do you need to understand? What do you need to have to create professional, world-class audio from home? You know, the kind of audio that keeps your voiceover clients coming back again and again. Good news. I have that information for you here today, so stick around and you'll find out. Hey, make sure you subscribe to the channel and also hit that notification bell so that you find out when my new videos come out because all of this content is created to help you be successful in voiceover. Now, make sure to hang around throughout the entire video because toward the end, I'm going to give you my most important tip to create world-class audio from home. Now, first of all, let me just say the purpose of this discussion is not to dig and get into the weeds of audio because we could literally spend hours going through everything there is to know about audio. But here's the good news. You don't need to know everything there is to know about audio. If you follow the advice that I give, then you can create great professional sounding audio from home. And the first thing that you need to know about is equipment. And the first thing you need to understand about equipment is that it's not the most important aspect of having great audio. And this may be a great surprise to you because you've been online, you've been seeing these discussions among different voiceover talent, debating this microphone and that microphone and this interface and this recording software. The reality is it's the least important aspect of creating great audio. And it's not to say that you don't need equipment, you do. And it's not to say that equipment's not important because it is, but in voiceover, it's the archer not the arrow. It's understanding how to operate the equipment to get the best possible sound. So what I'm going to do is go through several categories of things that you need to know and need to understand. First of all, a microphone. You've got to have a microphone, but what kind of microphone do you need? Well, there's a number of microphones that you could use successfully. You can buy an expensive one. I'm using a large diaphragm microphone. You could literally spend $5,000 or more, or I'm just, you know, you can buy an inexpensive microphone that costs about a hundred bucks. The very first microphone I used was a Marshall MXL 2001. You can buy them used now for about 50 or 60 bucks. I recorded national TV ads with that microphone. My clients never complained once. Now, when you can afford it and you want to go out and spend more, that's great. But the point is, again, it's not the equipment. It's how you utilize the equipment. Also, USB microphones. Now, several years ago, I would have said stay away from USB microphones. But nowadays, there's some really great USB microphones on the market. As a matter of fact, a lot of my students uh, utilize the Fifine K670. It costs about 50 bucks. Now, I'm not going to say that it sounds as good as a $1,000 large diaphragm condenser microphone, but most of your clients probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And you can certainly make a good living using a microphone like that. So that's the first thing you need to have is a microphone. And for that microphone, a couple of things. One, a pop filter. Now, this happens to be a pop filter. You've also seen them. They look like discs. Some are covered in nylon. Some are small discs that are made out of metal. But the point of a pop filter is to keep those plosives, the hard consonants, and the P's from the air from exploding and hitting the diaphragm and making a sound. It's good. It's just a, a good thing to have because you can get by without it, but you would have to have really good microphone technique. The second thing is you will need a shock mount for your microphones. If you look at my microphone, you'll notice this little deal here, right? That's a, this is a shock mount. It makes sure that the microphone is suspended by these elastic bands. The purpose of that is so that if I accidentally touch my desk, car drives by, anything happens or moves around me, that vibration doesn't carry into my microphone. So that's what you need, a microphone and a pop filter and a shock mount. The next thing you'll need if you're not using a USB microphone is an audio interface. So it's a box that will connect to your computer, usually by USB, and then to your microphone through a cable, XLR microphone cable. And what it does, it does two things. If your microphone requires phantom power, that interface face typically will provide that power. Secondly, it converts the your voice, the analog signal, into digital so that your computer can pick it up and recognize it and record it. So you will need an interface. And by the way, you don't need to go super expensive. Let me just make a quick recommendation. A great interface, as a matter of fact, I own a couple of them, is the Focusrite Scarlet. In particular, the Solo model. I believe, last I checked, costs less than 100 bucks and will do a very good job of getting your audio from your microphone into your computer. Next thing you're going to need is a computer. Good news. 
news, you probably already have one. Better news, the one you have is probably okay to use. Whether you use Windows or Mac really doesn't matter. Whatever you have, whatever you're accustomed to, I've used both. But the one thing that you have to be aware of is how loud is your computer. So if your computer has a fan and does create a noise, you want to be very aware of that and keep it away from your microphone. For instance, right now I'm in a booth, but my computer is outside the booth and cables are run in the booth so that there's separation between the computer and the microphone. Let's talk software. You have to have software to record into, but what do you use? Well, chances are your computer probably already has something that you can use. For instance, if you have a Mac, you probably have GarageBand. And if your computer doesn't have recording software, there's free software out there called Audacity. You can use it with Linux, Windows, or Mac. So there's a version for everybody and there are plenty of successful voiceover talent that use Audacity. I happen to use Adobe Audition. That's my software of choice. My only recommendation is if you do not have or use Pro Tools, do not get it. There are those out there that would say, well, you're not a pro voice talent unless you use Pro Tools. That is absolute nonsense. If you're a musician and you have it for multi-track recording and for mixing or maybe mastering, and that's what you understand and know, then by all means use it. But if you haven't used it before, there's a huge learning curve and it has way more functionality than you would ever need in voiceover. The next thing that you need to understand when it comes to recording great audio from home is you have to have good microphone technique. Regardless of whether you're using a $50 mic or a $5,000 mic, it really doesn't matter unless you have good technique. And first is proximity to the mic. How close should you be to the microphone? As a rule of thumb, you should be six to eight inches lips to microphone in distance. And that's regardless of what type of microphone you're using. An easy way to measure that is the tip of your pinky to the tip of your thumb. And if you put the pinky at the microphone and the thumb at your lips, that will give you the distance you should be. Sometimes perhaps if you're speaking a little more softly, perhaps you lean in an inch or two. If you're a little louder, maybe you lean back just a little bit. Maybe if you're doing a big high powered car commercial, but as a rule of thumb, six to eight inches and you're in good shape. The other thing is where should the microphone be in relation to the front of your mouth. Now, here's the thing. Be careful not to speak directly into the microphone. You want to keep your microphone what we call off axis. On axis would be speaking directly into the microphone. What happens there, the problem is that the wind, the air from your mouth hits that diaphragm and the plosives, the P's or a hard T or even a K can explode and make a sound that you don't want. It's easily remedied by making sure that your proper distance and that you're off axis, meaning you move the microphone or your face, your mouth, just two inches away from the microphone. So for instance, in this case, right now I'm facing directly into the microphone. We don't want that. But if I turn like this, two inches to the right, now I'm off axis and the air moves past the microphone and doesn't explode onto the diaphragm. All right, let's talk about processing. Now, there are two things when it comes to processing that you need to keep in mind. That is equalization or EQ and compression. It may be your audio sounds great as it is. You may not need to do anything, but if you do, typically the problem comes in one of a few areas. Let's first of all talk about EQ or equalization. Oftentimes we get this low, what we'll call boominess, the lower frequencies, the bass frequencies. There's too much or there's too much on the high end and we get sibilance and the S's and the SH's tend to sizzle and they sound like they're frying and we don't want the bassiness and we don't want the sibilance. And so by pulling those back on the EQ and if you're just starting off, I wouldn't even worry about the middle frequencies for now. You can always hire a professional to help you really dial this in. But to get started, just make sure there's not too much on the bottom end that would make it sound too bassy or muddy or too much on the top end that would make it sound like your, your S's and your SH's are sibilant or sound like they're, they're frying. You want to stay away from that. The other thing is compression. Sometimes you know, the audio can be a little inconsistent in terms of how loud it is or how soft it is, but compression can help even that out a little bit. Just experiment with the compression or the EQ that's built into your DAW, your software, your digital audio workstation, and experiment using just a little bit of EQ, just a hint of it will help even out those levels and make your audio sound better and sound more professional. All right, as promised, I've saved the best for last. The most important thing is the space in which you record. It's not your microphone. It's not your audio interface or your computer because you can put a great microphone in a bad space and get terrible audio. You can put a cheap microphone in a really good space and get great 
audio. So when it comes to great recording space, there are two things that we need to think about. One is how quiet is the space, and the other is how well treated acoustically is it. So there's sound treatment, and then there's soundproofing. Now, we all work from home. We all deal with airplanes and cars and kids, and so there is no perfect at-home solution, but you want to scout out the quietest place that you can find in your home. You can invest in something like a whisper room, which is what I have, but this will set you back several thousand dollars. So I started off by working out of my uh, bedroom closet. And so you might find that to be a good solution as well. Secondly, well-treated. Now, when I worked out of my closet, it was perfect because I was surrounded by clothing, which absorbed the sound reflections. And so treatment, acoustic treatment, makes sure that your voice is not bouncing off against the wall and that you're getting that boxy reverb sound that nobody wants. And again, we simply reduce that by having something that's soft. And you could get into professional acoustic panels and foam, and that's all well and good. But you can also use things like sound blankets. I've used mattress toppers. But by having soft, absorbent material around you, it keeps your voice from bouncing off the walls. The downside is oftentimes it will leave your audio sounding a little, a little bassier, a little more muffled, a little muddier, which you may have to work with your equalization, your EQ, to bring down that low end. So you're going to have to experiment around with that, but you want to make sure that you don't have your voice bouncing off the walls. So to recap, keep in mind, having great audio is 80% the space in which you operate, how quiet is it and how well treated is it? That's where to put your time and focus. The other 20% is the equipment that you utilize. So make sure that you're investing your time, your energy, your resources in the things that will make the biggest difference because having good audio is a must when it comes to being successful in voiceover. Hey, thanks for checking out the video. I appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe and share and check out also below my nine steps to voiceover success. I'll talk to you soon.